Estamos aqui hoje, mais uma vez, reunidos para mais um ciclo de palestras promovidos pelo LAIS, o Laboratório de Inovação Tecnológica da UFRN. Hoje, numa parceria internacional com a Conquerex. E hoje eu convido, mais uma vez, o professor Ricardo Valetinho, nosso coordenador, para fazer a apresentação dos nossos palestrantes. Eu não, eu não gosto só de ficar apresentando, não. Eu pedi a Carilana e a Carilana, não, Ricardo, você apresenta. Então, tá bom, eu tive de responsabilidade. Então, primeiro, eu queria agradecer Jacob e Débora pela participação. Jacob, seja bem-vindo ao Brasil, primeira vez que você está aqui. Então, essa parceria com a Débora e com o Jacob, ela inicia em 2016. 2016, eu vou para um evento lá, que é o Brasil Conference, é, num evento onde tinha brasileiros palestrando, e, do, e eu soube do trabalho de, Jack, de, 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 de Débora lá. Depois disso, em 2017, nós fizemos um contato com a Débora, né? e aí, é, nesse contato, em 2018, nós fechamos uma parceria através de uma associação brasileira, que é a BIMO, e agora a gente está fechando também, junto com ela, um plano de trabalho, uma cooperação bilateral. Então, queria convidar para a palestra primeiro, acho que é do Jacob, onde ele vai falar de machine learning, todo, toda, aplicada toda essa área é, biomédica, na área de genômica, que é uma, uma vertente que o laboratório está entrando agora. E depois, Débora, que vai falar sobre o empreendedorismo na academia, é, o que eles fazem lá nos Estados Unidos, o que, é que a gente pode aprender com ele, o que, é que nós podemos ensinar para eles. Então, é uma... É, trazer esses pesquisadores, Débora vai contar, eu não vou fazer a apresentação, eu acho que cada um pode se apresentar quando tiver, é mais interessante, mas Débora é uma pesquisadora brasileira que foi para os Estados Unidos para empreender no campo da ciência. E Jacob é um aluno do MIT, que são parceiros em um grande empreendimento na área de diagnóstico precoce para câncer. Então, eles têm uma expertise que pode somar conosco em várias ações que nós estamos fazendo hoje, para o governo federal, para o Ministério da Saúde, e que pode ser levada essa experiência para o mundo. Não só é que eu, nessa última reunião que nós tivemos com ele lá, agora nessa última missão junto com o Carilane, não só no campo da, do desenvolvimento científico propriamente dito, que é realmente o produto principal desse trabalho que a gente está fazendo com eles, mas de fazer, de em cima disso, construir um desenho melhor de cooperação técnico-científico. Entendeu aí, Magaldi? E aí, esse modelo que a gente está fazendo com a Conquerex, ele é muito inovador. Por exemplo, se o Ciências Sem Fronteiras tivesse utilizado esse modelo que nós estamos utilizando com a Conquerex, que é um modelo de cooperação internacional baseado na entrega de produtos, e, pô, provavelmente teria sido muito mais proveitoso. Entendeu? Algo que a gente teria conseguido dar uma extensão e uma repercussão muito maior às cooperações internacionais que foram feitas. Então, um outro produto dessa cooperação bilateral que a gente está fazendo com eles é justamente entregar um documento que sistematiza todo o processo de cooperação internacional é, aonde a gente envolve a parte de inovação e cooperação com o setor produtivo. Então, eu vou deixar a palestra para o palestrante agora, Jacob. É uma satisfação recebê-lo aqui para a sua palestra. Thank you very much. Um, how can I access the presentation? Just. Well, very nice to meet you all. I had a chance to spend uh, two days in Natal right now, and it's been wonderful. Um, I had a chance to visit LAIS and the laboratory of hardware, laboratory of uh, biomedical design, laboratory of informatics. Very inspiring, very hardworking students. I've enjoyed it very much. I also had a chance to visit the beach. Amazing. I come from Slovakia. We are probably 700 kilometers far from any and a big body of water. So this is pretty unusual for me. But uh, as soon as we're ready,
I also had a lot of great Brazilian food. <laughs> I'm sorry? Oh, I love all of it. I love all of it. Yes. <laughs> Muy bom. Muy bom. Dois dedinhos, yeah. Café brasileiro. Uh. We had a French professor here, and uh, the first thing that she said, she said uh, for the journal here, she said, I love cachaça. <laughs> Probably more, more professors followed, right? <laughs> oh, cool. Um, all right, this is me. I'm wearing the same shirt. It's easy to recognize. This is my special events shirt. <laughs> I take pictures like this maybe once every two years. Um, so. I'm currently an undergraduate student at MIT, studying computer science, I'm taking courses and doing research in computational biology, computational and, um, and in my free time, I like to explore, learn about, and practice startups. I also uh, have passion in healthcare and machine learning, so what we do with Deborah and Concrex bridges all three of these. I also like to dance Brazilian samba a little bit. <laughs> but not gonna brag about that. Thank you. All right, so I, I mentioned Concrex. The Concrex was uh, started by me and Deborah in 2015, where we met at the MIT Global Entrepreneurship Bootcamp. It was a very intense week. And after that week, I learned about Deborah's uh, technology and her mission to create a test for multiple types of cancer using just blood di directly from the patient. And this uh, inspired me very much because I have a personal uh, cancer story in my family. So I was like, okay, let's do this, Deborah. Let's, let's make this happen. And so it's been four years now almost. Uh, we're going to have an anniversary in a couple of days. And we are building a test that can detect 10 types of cancers and is affordable and accurate at the same time. We're hoping to have this test as a regular annual tests that people can take uh, for prevention. We started implementing, on, to on top of uh, Deborah's biosensor, on top of her nanotechnology, we have implemented a layer of software and a layer of AI and machine learning. First, to figure out which are the best biomarkers to use for different uh, types of cancer to be detected. And second, uh, once we actually detect these biomarkers, once we measure the raw data, how do we take these raw data and how do we combine them together to create a diagnosis? Because it's, it's simple to tell whether uh, on a line, a, a data point on a line is larger than a value or smaller than a value. But if you have biological data, if you have expression levels, they are very complex and sometimes they influence one another. Sometimes uh, they interact. And you have these higher level or higher, higher degree interactions, higher, higher order functions that uh, are not really understandable by experts. Uh, and so we build an AI on top of that to interpret these raw data. And that's how we are able to achieve accuracy, specificity, and sensitivity of our test above uh, 90%. All right, switching gears from introduction. Um, so part of my lecture is about the, the, gene, the genomics. And 
genomics as a, as a study uh, began in the, in the 70s. The first gene uh, was sequenced in uh, 1977. It was uh, a bacteria, I believe. It was very short. And then other genes, other, other genomes were being sequenced and added. And human genes were being sequenced and added. The, actually, the first uh, human gene that to be sequenced was uh, BRCA1, which is a genome uh, that under certain conditions, under certain mutations, has a high correlation with breast cancer in women. So in, uh, in the 90s, the US government and, and other partners started a big collaboration to sequence the whole human genome. And at the time, uh, they estimated that this effort would take approximately three billion dollars and 15 years. And this was a research that took place in over 20 institutions in the USA, in England, in France, all over the world. But it was, it was, led, uh, it was led from the US. And a few interesting things that, that uh, they learned. First, after the first genome was sequenced, in fully sequenced in 2000, 2001, well, fully sequenced. It was fully sequenced, but until this very day, the whole genome is not fully understood. There are areas in the genome that are still unclear where they exactly belong and what is their exact meaning. Why? Um, when genes are sequenced, um, the equipment produces parts of the gene, of the genome, that are up to 300, 400 uh, codons, uh, letters long. And unfortunately, some parts of the genome have either high repetition or have very similar patterns. And then it's unclear where these, since these sequences are so short, where these sequences exactly belong. So it's an ongoing challenge to map fully the genome, but um, Technically, we can say it was done in 2001 for the first time. And at the time, it cost $3 billion, or almost. And the cost per genome has been decreasing very rapidly. On this graph, this blue line, this blue line up here, is Moore's Law. And Moore's Law says it's a, it's a, it's a law from... Uh, computational hardware, which basically says that at a given price, the computational power doubles within approximately every two years. It's not exactly two years, but it's, a, it's an exponential growth. And it's a, it's a theory, anyway. And the, human, the cost to sequence one human genome was following that trend, and then it started rapidly, rapidly, rapidly decreasing with next generation sequencing uh, machines and new equipment uh, that is able to massively parallelize the sequencing efforts. So right now, one genome costs approximately $1,000 to be sequenced, the full, the, full, the full genome. And it can take up to a week of, of expert labor, different assets have to be prepared, and then, oops, and then, a lot of data is generated. Since a human genome has uh, around four billion letters, so that's four gigabytes of data. But since the raw data is in very small strings, they need to do a very deep coverage. So they need to sequence the genome 30 to 60 times to be able to put it back together. So in the end, one genome creates around 200 gigabytes of raw data. What typically happens is that the company that sequences the data, processes the raw data, and then provides uh, the customer with the, with the genome that is put together. So since 2001, there has been a global effort to understand the genome in the population what are the similarities between people that have breast cancer? 
what are the similarities between people that have Down syndrome. And to be able to make these conclusions, you have to have a lot, a lot of data. Since uh, every position in the genome has only four possibilities, um, there are, there's a high occurrence of false positives, of events that seem that are correlated or causational, but in the end, they are not. So when, uh, when a claim is made that a certain genomic mutation correlates with a certain disease, the probability values that are being discussed are on, on the order of, uh, the p-values are on the order of 10 to the minus 50. Just, just as a reference. Um, yes, so first, if we want to understand stuff, we need a lot, a lot, a lot of data. So many countries pledged to gather a lot of data and um, what is called a 100K club was created. And this is a club of countries where each country said that we will sequence 100,000 human genomes. And it's, it's really cool because we have, we have the USA, we have the UK. By the way, the, the UK sequenced the 100,000th genome on the 2nd of August this year. And it cost only, only around 500 million pounds. So it's exponentially cheaper than uh, the first genome. Then we have France, we have Australia, Japan, all cool countries. We have um, Estonia. Estonia is pretentious. They didn't actually sequence the whole genome. They took a shortcut. They sequenced only a very, very small part of the genome, which is called the exosome. It's much, much cheaper. But, you know, they're in the club. Um, and then there's a second group of countries, which are, let's say, not nearly that cool. And that's... Uh, and I'm really glad this is recorded, I just realized. Um, so this is Turkey, Saudi Arabia, United Arab Emirates, and China. So China has been known to use private data to discriminate people. There's, they're running an experiment in the city where they, based on how you behave, how they gather data, video footage, how you drive on the street, what you purchase, and based on this, they assign a score to you. And with this score, you are able to get a loan or move to a different part of the city, etc. So it's very, I would say it's, it's, it's very scary, at, at, at the least. Um, also, when, uh, when I was in China on a, on a business trip last summer, I learned that they have an electronic health record and what they do is that every visit to a doctor is electronically recorded and sent to a central database and they gather terabytes of data every day. So when you think about it, when you think about what they are able and, and willing to do, it's a, it's a little bit scary that they have the most intimate information about you uh, that is possible. And I'll talk about the ethics of, of uh, genome sequencing later on. But with all this data, as I already mentioned, there's a, there's a problem. There's a storage problem, there's a, an understanding interpretation problem, and an understanding problem. Because if you have a genome of a single person, sometimes there are deviations from the standard, from the reference genome, which is another person. And these deviations could be meaningful, like the mutation in the BRCA gene, which says that this person will, has a 10 times higher probability of developing breast cancer sometime in their life. But at the same time, it could be meaningless. It could be a mutation in a part of the genome that doesn't really influence anything. It's just there to fill out space. It's an artifact of evolution, something that is not used. So this needs to be understood. Uh, events of importance must be detected and then aligned 
across multiple genomes, genomes and when they are aligned, uh, the correlation and the predictive models can be built. But once these models are built, they actually have to go from the research to the clinician. They need to go to someone who can act on them. So it could be a doctor, it could be a health management system. But the question is, if a doctor gets information that the person is more likely to develop cancer, but without the information when and how and where exactly and what exact type, how is this doctor going to operate with this information? What are they going to do? Are they going to tell the patient? Are they not going to tell the patient? Are they going to recommend a certain screening? Is it, is it going to be a screening from a certain company? Is this company related? You know, there's a lot of potential pitfalls and this could be misused. So a lot of challenges. And it's not really clear how these challenges will be addressed. On the computation side, a lot of, lot of since there's a lot of data uh, in, on the gen genomic side, but also as, as you move across the biological process and you look at proteins or epigenomes, etc., there's a lot, a lot of data. Um, so the ideal way, let's say, uh, how to deal with this data, how to understand it is uh, machine learning. And some, based on application, uh, some tasks use supervised uh, learning, some use unsupervised learning. You have hidden Markov models, decision trees. I read an article. There was this uh, company that used proteins and using eight proteins and a random forest, which is, you know, you open your Python and it's three lines of, of, of scikit code, random forest, they were able to achieve classification rates better than what is on the market. So, uh, uh, but at the same time, oh, this seems trivial, but at the same time, it's not very clear which machine learning or which AI approach will be best. We've been seeing uh, that a lot of progress in Machine learning has been done through deep learning, through basically building a neural, neural network and then throwing petabytes of data onto the, onto the network. And it works. It works great for Google, where they have a ton of data. So, you know, we have good speech recognition, we have good handwritten digit recognition, etc. But understanding the genome and, and understanding biological data is, is not so, it has to be more interpretable. You can build a neural network, but will you understand what is happening behind the scenes? And will the clinician be able to understand what's happening behind the scenes? And will they be able to act on it? Because information is not enough. We need to be able to make decisions and help people. So there's a lot, there's a lot, a lot of stuff happening in, in machine learning and in AI and healthcare. There are these Silicon Valley companies that claim we can design drugs with AI. All we need is a lot of data and it's going to be perfect. Of course, no, no, the data is problem. Anyway, they, there are people who are taking this too far. They're claiming they don't need a clinician, they don't need a doctor to guide the system, and there are people who are taking more reasonable approach. But on the, on the journey, on the healthcare journey, there are many points where um, AI or machine learning can be used. So let's start with research. Drug discovery. For example, how drug discovery typically works a company has a library of molecules. They have sometimes hundreds of thousands of molecules that they've tested, and they either worked for one specific purpose, like an antibiotic that works for you know, a, sp a specific 
type of condition and should not be used for other stuff. Uh, and then they have, for every molecule that works, they have hundreds of thousands of molecules that did not work and will never work. And they have extensive amount of information about this. So one area is how about we take all this information and we try to find new targets. What if we found, what if we take an antibiotic and combine it with ibuprofen and try it for cancer? This kind of thinking. That, that's, that's one approach that's happening. Combination therapy. And doing this, they can, uh, it's possible to use machine learning to predict how a molecule, let's say you have a molecule, a drug that is meant to come to a protein and disable it. And by disabling, it means that the molecule comes and creates a chemical bond or cuts some part of the protein. And this way, it disables the protein. So you can use machine learning to predict how two molecules will interact using just the chemical formulas uh, for these molecules. You can retest not working molecules for new targets, etc. You can do genetic research. You can look at clinical trials. Clinical trials have a lot of problems. Uh, a, with their design. B, with actually understanding all the variants uh, that are coming from the patient and all the variants that are introduced by the process of running the trial. Clinical trials can be simulated. Clinical trials can be reanalyzed. You can, you can look at many clinical trials that succeeded, and you can try to predict whether a clinical trial will succeed. You can try to design a clinical trial that would succeed. In hospitals, you can try to look at patients that you have right there, patients that maybe you're doing blood measurements all, every morning, and they are on a blood pressure meter and, and blood, blood oxygenation meter. And you can look, and look, look at this data and you can try to predict wh when and whether these patients will get worse and when is the best time to intervene. You can look at the hospital and try to predict co-infections. Okay. Medical imaging, that's actually a good a good leap forward. So medical imaging is, is very cool. Um, one of the cool stuff um, that's happening around me at MIT is uh, using or improving uh, breast cancer detection from uh, MRI, or sorry, from mammography. And this is a great example of, of machine learning in healthcare on multiple levels. First of all, as any venture in healthcare, uh, it was started by a very passionate person because they understood that the success chance is low and uh, the rewards are questionable. But the person, the professor at MIT, was personally interested because she herself is a breast cancer survivor and she understood how important it is to diagnose cancer early. Second, um, they are collaborating with a large hospital. Um, so this is a research at MIT. Um, in Boston, where MIT is, um, there's one um, track of subway. And on this track of subway, there's Harvard, MIT, and MGH. MGH is Massachusetts General Hospital, one of the best hospitals in all of the United States. So there's a pattern of artificial intelligence startups coming out of MIT, collaborating with this hospital to create products. And this is one of them. They achieved accuracy much better than experts, they, but in order to do that, uh, they looked at 60,000 60, images and diagnoses from the MGH hospital. So that's the second point. Very strong collaboration between experts in technology and experts in medicine.
And the third point is that they've been doing this for quite a while now. And it's, it's a pitfall of medical startups that it takes a very long time. They showed with the first 600 images that they are better than a consortium of experts, but they have to go and prove it on 60,000 patients in order for the system to even be considered whether it's going to be implemented in a hospital or not. And then if it's allowed to be implemented, it still doesn't mean it will be implemented and it will be used. Uh, okay. There are a bunch of, th this is another example of, of medical imaging uh, company where they look at images, slides of cells when a sample is taken from a patient. You need an expert to come and analyze the sample. This takes a lot of time. So they are trying to standardize this. They are using, again, machine learning to increase the number of patients that can be treated per unit of time, but to also increase the accuracy of the, of the prediction. Another startup is from the area of uh, personal health care. So this, these guys are uh, trying to help women conceive. And it's a, it's a very big problem for multiple reasons. Uh, there are like genetic reasons, healthcare reasons um, that are influencing this. Lately, there are studies on how thyroid functions influence uh, fertility. And it's very difficult to understand this all this information and make decisions because once again, the data is from different modalities, from different kinds, higher order or higher order interactions. And so a machine learning model is well suited uh, to get to provide advice. And they, there's a whole suite of these lifestyle startups, I would, I would call them, where they give recommendations to people how to behave in order to achieve ABCD. Um, another is, hmm? yes, NLP, natural language processing. In the US, when there's a visit, um, a report is generated. Um, the, the money in the US flows usually from private insurance to the healthcare provider and then the person who goes to the hospital pays to the private insurance. So after a visit, the doctor creates a report, and based on the report, uh, the doctor is reimbursed. So how do we know whether the reimbursement rate, the reimbursement amount, and the diagnosis were correct? How do we do this at scale? And that's, uh, that's one of the challenges Verbotics AI is, is trying to solve. So the idea is that by correctly classifying uh, diagnosis using an international standard, ICD-10 is an international standard for coding diseases. It can both save money for the patient. Potentially, this can help use the health record in the future for a different machine learning model. But it also helps save the money for the insurer. And in the, in, the, in the US, there's a, a lot of startups that are focusing on, on the private sector. They are focusing on the insurance or the, drug, the companies that are developing drugs or the hospitals that are treating patients. All right. So, changing gears. First, we have a lot of data. It's not clear how we, how, what we do with that data. Second, we have a lot of companies that are actually gathering even more and more data from the hospitals, from the patients, from your Fitbits, from our Apple Watches, from everything. Third, what should be thinking, what should be acting, what, what, right? So a good example is this company called 23andMe. 23andMe, they're one of the first providers of personalized genetic testing. 
These guys are faking it the same way Estonia is. This is not the whole genome. This is exosome. It's parts of the genome where you can find, for example, whether whether you have a certain hereditary, hereditary disease or whether you have a higher chance of developing cancer, etc. But it's not nearly the whole genome. It's a, it's a very small fraction, in fact. And they are probably only looking at a specific part. But regardless, costs 200 bucks, which is very cheap in the US. This is, this is very cheap. I've been to a, an eye doctor and I had to pay like 200 bucks for half an hour visit. So in the healthcare system in the US, 200 bucks is very cheap. You buy it off Amazon. During Prime Day, this costs $100. So how do these guys make money? Well, they take this data and they sell it. When you run this test, you have to check a checkbox that says, my data can be used for research purposes. So they are selling this data. Investors of companies like this are people who invest in data companies. What then happened is that if this data leaks somehow and your insurer sees that you have a higher risk of a disease, they will increase your insurance because, you know, there's a higher chance you will need the money back from them. And this is not the only occasion. There are, I, I told this story today morning. There was, a, there was a girl that was trying to be admitted to kindergarten and it leaked somehow to the kindergarten that she had a high, very high probability of developing cystic fibrosis. Now, cystic fibrosis makes the child sick all the time. When the child is sick all the time, the children around it are typically sick all the time as well. So the, the kindergarten came to the mom and, and they were like, yeah, sorry, we cannot accept your child. She might develop cystic fibrosis. We already have one child with cystic fibrosis. We cannot risk this. It, it's, it's risking our business. So there's a lot of potential discrimination, a lot of bad stuff that can happen. That's on the insurance side, but on the employee, employee employment relationship side, the same thing. In the US, oftentimes, the employers pay insurance to the employees. And there have been cases where genomic data leaked and employers denied certain benefits to the employees based on that knowledge. And you know, genetic, genomic knowledge is amazing to have, but it's not conclusive. Just because you have a higher probability of something does, doesn't mean it will happen. But it's very easy to discriminate based on that. So when I go to 23andMe and I do a test, who owns the data? Do I own it? Do they own it? Is it in the ether that you can find it? Is it traded on Silk Road? Where is it? How is this data stored? Is, is it accessible only by researchers who are compliant with all the policies established by universities, national institutes, and governments to prevent discrimination, to prevent anonymization of data? If you have genomic data and Fitbit data or something very, 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 or your, you know, subway data or something, suddenly you can take these two, put them together, and you can, you can find out who the person is. And what about relatives? That's my favorite. So there have been, you know, we share, we share a lot of genetic data with our distant relatives, with our cousins or aunts or uncles. We share, you know, 12% depending on how, how distant the relative is. So what can happen is that my uncle gets sequenced and my aunt gets sequenced 
and using their two sequences, and they can infer information about me. So doing genomic sequencing of, of your own genome in the state that, that is right now is not only about your own risks and safety and benefits, but it also you have to also consider your broader relatives. There have been cases where people got sequenced and they found out that their parents were not their parents. And that's, that's, that's scary. And, you know, this should be under control and consent. So, there have been some laws put in place in the US how to, how to handle and treat data. It's not possible to discriminate or technically should not be possible to discriminate based on the genomic data. It still is, and it's a big problem, and we should aim to disallow it. And with that, thank you very much for your attention. I hope I didn't scare you very much. Um, I would be very happy to accept any questions, whether right now in person, but also if you're too shy or the question comes later in your mind, here's my email address. So please, if there are any questions. Yes. So, um, welcome. Your presentation was very good. Um, so, in your opinion, is artificial intelligence ever going to fully replace humans in the field of genomic research? Uh, is AI going to replace humans sometime in the future, like completely in the field of research? That's a that's a good question because you know to some extent it already has um, a AI and machine learning has been extensively used to label uh, given a sequence right the way we understand what is a gene and what is a node is to a large degree using machine learning so it's it's always there always has to be some expert and you have to run experiments like you know, you isolate the gene, you think it correlates with hair growth. So you isolate it, you run some gene editing to replicate it in bacteria or mice to verify whether this is true or not. So in the, in the moment of discovery and, and you know, predictions, correlations, yes, it has to a large degree replace humans. But then down the pipeline, where you ver verify whether this claim is true or not, that's not really now. Like, you can talk about automation, but not really AI. Yeah. Well, thanks for, for the presentation. I, I would like to know why, what kind uh, of machine learnings are most used in, genom in genomics. Is, uh, there are uh, deep learning, or uh, there are other models that are, are more interpretable. For example, you 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 talk about if you can explain more. Uh, that's a good question. What machine learning models are used in genomics mostly? Um, I would say it's a combination, and it really depends on on what exactly uh, you are looking for, what exactly you are doing. Um, if you have a lot of data, like you have 100,000 genomes, and um, you're looking at the whole genome, you, you can use deep learning. Sometimes you are trying to, what, what's, what's usually happening is that Bayesian probabilistic models are, are used, um, hidden Markov models, to label different parts of the genome. Because then you can more easily visualize your assumptions and your models, predictions, or your you know, models in their mechanisms. I would say it's, it's a variety. As, as I said, I've seen in research, I've seen everything. <laughs> yeah, basically everything. Um, yeah. It's usually more complex stuff. Linear classifiers tend not to be used or you don't use, 
when clustering is used, for example, the specific heuristics to a given problem are designed. Um, lately, I've seen autoencoders for cancer classification, but as you, or or guns. But then again, as you use like these more fancy techniques, they tend to be less interpretable. So it's great if you can if you can project your genomic data onto a two-dimensional plane and then classify 15 different types of cancer and you you know you see beautiful cancers beautiful clusters of, of cancers but what what do you do with that because you know you don't understand what's happening under under the hood Thank you.